section number twelve of marvels of scientific invention this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c marvels of scientific invention by thomas w corbin the most striking invention of recent times part one probably no invention has made such a sensation during recent years as wireless telegraphy and since it is the direct outcome of the most obtruse purely scientific investigations there could be no more appropriate subject for a place in this book for many years there has been a belief in the existence of a mysterious something to which has been given the name of the ether totally different it should be noted from the chemical of the same name it is entirely a creature of the intellect none of our senses give us the slightest direct indication of its existence no one has either seen felt heard smelt or tasted it yet we feel that it must exist for the simple reason that some things which our senses do tell us are utterly inexplicable without it it was originally thought of in connection with light standing at night upon the top of a hill we see the lights of a town a mile away how is it that those distant gas or electric lamps affect our eyes they are a mile away and the idea that one object can affect another at a distance is one which the human mind refuses to accept we feel compelled to believe that there is something in contact with the source of light which is affected first and through which the disturbance whatever it may be is conveyed to our eyes with which it must also be in contact we feel that there must be a something stretching from our eyes to the distant objects by which the light is carried of course the air fills the space referred to but that cannot be the carrier of light for if we look through a glass vessel from which the air has been exhausted we see distant objects undimmed we also have good reason to believe that the air belongs specially to our globe and does not extend upwards for more than a few miles consequently it cannot be air which brings sunlight and starlight we are forced to fall back therefore upon the belief in something of which we have no other knowledge which must fill all the vacant spaces in the whole universe passing even between the particles of which ordinary matter is composed reaching as far as the remotest star able to penetrate everything and consequently not excludable from the most perfect vacuum it is something so different from anything of which we have any direct knowledge that one is tempted sometimes to doubt whether there must not be some other explanation of light in order to transmit light at the speed at which we find it does in fact travel the ether must be more rigid than the hardest substance we know of many many thousand times more rigid indeed yet it seems to offer no resistance to the passage of the planets through it still there is no other alternative so far as men can conceive and we are compelled therefore to believe in the existence of the ether the first things discovered by the telescope were the larger satellites of jupiter with that precision for which astronomers are noted they soon drew up timetables showing not only the past movements of these bodies but also their future ones they were soon puzzled however by the obvious fact that the moons of jupiter were not working according to schedule to use a railway expression they got later and later for a time 
then gradually quickened up until they got too fast. Then they slowed down again. This repeated itself, and is going on still, with this difference, however, that the cause has been discovered and the schedules amended accordingly. The solution of this puzzle was that, when the earth and the great planet are at the same side of the sun, they are some 186 millions of miles nearer together than when they are on opposite sides of the sun. The evolutions of the satellites are quite regular, according to the astronomer's calculations, but they seem to the earthly astronomers to vary, because of the time which light took to traverse that 186 millions of miles. When the two bodies were nearest together, the occurrences seemed to happen about 1,000 seconds, 16 minutes, earlier than when they were farthest apart. Consequently, it became evident that light took 1,000 seconds to travel 186 million miles, or that, in other words, it moved at the prodigious speed of 186,000 miles per second. That discovery was, of course, many years ago, but experiments since have proved the figure mentioned to be about right. It put beyond question the fact that the action of a distant light upon the eye was not an action at distance, for such action, were it possible, would take effect at once. Seeing that light passed from the distant satellites at a definite velocity and took a certain time to reach us, it was evident that it was, during that time, passing through a medium of some sort, and that medium must be the ether, for no alternative explanation will suffice. So it became recognized that light really consists of waves or undulations of some sort in the ether, that a distant, luminous body set these waves going, that they traveled with a definite velocity, and then, striking our eyes, produced a sensation known as light. Many things were found out about light in the years which followed the discovery of its velocity. The lengths of the waves were ascertained, that is to say, the distance from the crest of one to the crest of the next. The different lengths were sorted out and found to give rise to different colors, while longer waves, which produced no sensation of light, were found to carry heat, thereby explaining how the heat reaches us from a distant fire, or from the sun. Of the actual nature of the waves, however, little was known, although there was a vague idea that they were connected in some way with electricity, at which point in the story there comes in the famous name of James Clerk Maxwell, a professor of Cambridge University, who in 1864 produced before the Royal Society the explanation of the nature of the waves and their connection with electricity and magnetism. That in itself was a wonderful achievement, but far more wonderful still is the fact that he truly predicted the existence of longer waves than any then known, which no one knew how to cause, or how to detect if caused. That prediction has since been fulfilled. The long waves have been found. We know how to make them, and how to perceive their presence. They are the messengers which carry our wireless messages. The discovery of these, at that time unknown waves, on paper, by simply calculating and reasoning about them, is more marvelous even than the feat of atoms and the verrier in discovering a planet on paper before anyone had seen it. It established Maxwell among the heroes of science for all time. A magnet acts upon a piece of iron some distance away. The pole must be transmitted through some kind of ether. A current of electricity behaves in the same way, 
acting precisely as a magnet, with power to affect things at a distance. Again, an ether is necessary. A dynamo works by moving a magnet past a wire which it does not touch, therefore generating current in it. There again, an ether is necessary to transmit the effect from the one to the other. Taking, then, the known magnetic effects of an electric current and the electrifying effects of magnets, he was able to show that the same ether accounted for all, and for the transmission of light as well, that, in fact, there was but one ether which performed all these various duties. He proved from the known facts about electricity and magnetism that waves such as he imagined would, in fact, move with the speed of light, and once knowing the nature of the waves, he asserted that in all probability there were others of which men had then no practical knowledge. Maxwell's theory soon set experimenters searching for the means of producing the long waves which he had predicted would be found. Several authorities had before then stated their belief that the current derived from a laden jar was not simply a flow in one direction. They suggested, and gave grounds for the belief, that the current surged to and fro for some time before it settled down, that it swung to and fro, indeed, like a pendulum. There may be some of my readers who are unacquainted with this interesting piece of electrical apparatus, the laden jar. It is a convenient form of what is called an electrostatic condenser. This is two conductors, generally in the form of two plates, with an insulator between them. In the Leyden jar, the insulator is a glass jar, while the plates are coatings of tin foil, one inside and the other outside, on connecting one coating to one pole of a battery and the other to the other pole, they become charged, one positively and the other negatively. One, that is, acquires an excess of electricity, while the other becomes deficient to an exactly similar extent. When the two are afterwards connected by a wire, the surplus on one flashes through it to make good the deficiency on the other. Rushing first of all from positive coating to negative, electrical inertia causes it to overshoot the mark and to recharge the jar with the charges reversed. Then current begins to flow back again, doing the same several times over until at last equilibrium is established. The power to absorb and hold a charge of electricity which is the characteristic of a condenser, is called capacity. What then is electrical inertia? I have already referred to the effect which the creation of a magnetic field around a current has upon neighboring conductors. It also has an effect upon itself. As soon as the current begins to flow, it builds up the magnetic field, and in the process some of its energy is exhausted. On the original current ceasing, however, the magnetic field collapses back on to the conductor once more and in so restores that energy. This occurs whenever current flows, but it is specially noticeable in long conductors, like submarine cables. In them the battery has to act for a considerable time before any current reaches the farther end. It is in the meantime employed in building up the magnetic field around the wire. Then when the battery has ceased to act, the current still comes flowing out at the farther end. The magnetic field is giving back the energy expended upon it. Thus a current is reluctant to start flowing through a conductor and, having started, is 
disinclined to stop. This is called inductance, and it has exactly the same effect upon the current that inertia has upon a body. What inertia is to a material body, inductance is to an electric current. And lastly, the resistance which the conductor offers to the passage of the current is precisely analogous to the friction of the water in a pipe. So we see the capacity of the two coatings of the jar and the inductance which occurs in the connecting wire cause the current to oscillate to and fro for a while when the jar is discharged which surging or oscillation is ultimately stopped by the resistance of the wire the two coatings and the wire form what is called an oscillatory circuit we can now resume our story after much experimenting hertz of Karlsruhe discovered the fact that when a discharge was taking place in an oscillatory circuit, tiny sparks passed between the ends of a curved wire held some distance away. His apparatus is illustrated in figures 6 and 7. The former, which is termed nowadays a Hertz oscillator, is simply two metal discs almost connected by a thick wire. The wire is broken, however, at the center and the two halves terminate in two metal balls. Each ball is connected to one terminal of an induction coil. Now the current comes from an induction coil in a series of spurts. It is not an alternating current exactly, since every alternate current is so feeble as to be negligible, but it is practically an intermittent current always in the same direction. Thus we may call one the positive end of the coil and the other the negative. A short current comes along with every backward movement of the little vibrating arm which forms a part of the apparatus. This breaking of the primary circuit may take place perhaps fifty times per second so that the intermittent secondary currents will succeed each other at intervals of a fiftieth of a second, or even less. The brain reels at the attempt to think of a fiftieth of a second, but it is really quite a long interval as these things go, and during that interval quite a lot happens. For the current, first of all, all charges the two plates as a condenser. When they are as full as they will hold, the current overflows, as it were, across the gap between the two balls. Now an air gap, a gap that is filled with air, between two conductors, is a very strong insulator. But when current has once broken through it, it becomes a fairly good conductor. Hence, as soon as the first spark has passed between the two knobs, the plates become connected almost as if a wire were passed from one to the other. And there we have quite a good oscillatory circuit. There is capacity at each end and a fairly long length of wire to provide the inductance. Consequently, that breakdown of the insulation of the air in the spark gap is followed by electrical oscillations which take place with inconceivable rapidity Yet, because of the resistance of the spark gap, which is considerable even after it has been broken through, the oscillations do not continue for long. They have died away long before the lapse of the fiftieth of a second, when the next impulse comes along from the coil. In the meantime, the air gap regains its insulating properties, and so, on the arrival of the next impulse, the whole thing occurs once more. Thus a little train of oscillations is produced for every impulse from the coil. Every train causes a corresponding disturbance in the ether and sends off a train of electromagnetic waves, and these, falling upon the distant wire, generate it in a train similar to that 
which brought them into being these trains in hertz's simple apparatus manifested themselves in the form of minute sparks leaping across the small gap between the ends of the curved wire figure seven it was in eighteen eighty eight that hertz made this discovery of a way to detect long electric waves he subjected the matter to many more experiments and found that the waves have many points in common with light rays he found that they were reflected from certain surfaces just as light is reflected from the surface of a mirror he made prisms which were able to bend them as light waves are bent by prism of glass some things appeared to be transparent to them as clear glass is to light while others are opaque it does not follow that the same things which reflect light waves reflect electric waves and so on the latter can pass through a brick wall for example but the same divergence is to be observed between light and radiant heat of which the action of glass is a familiar example clear glass will let light through almost undimmed yet we use it for fire screens to shield us from too much radiant heat the important fact is that all three light radiant heat and hertzian waves in addition to traveling at the same speed are reflected absorbed or refracted according to precisely the same principles this is almost perfect testimony to their essential identity the difference between them as has been said already is the distance from crest to crest of the waves the wavelength that is and the reader will wonder by what manner of means this mysterious dimension can be ascertained in spite of its seeming mystery the method is very simple it is based upon the fact that two sets of similar waves traveling at the same speed in opposite directions interfere with one another in a peculiar way suppose that one set of waves travel along to a reflector and strike it vertically then another set will travel back from the reflector exactly similar to the first except that their direction will be opposite and the result will be that at certain intervals they will exactly neutralize each other so that at those points there will be no wave action appreciable at all those points where no action is to be perceived are called nodes and they are exactly half a wavelength apart this will be quite easily understood from the accompanying diagrams in each of these diagrams the set of waves marked a are supposed to be moving from left to right while those denoted by b are reflected back and are moving from right to left it will be noticed that each wavy line has a straight line drawn through it dividing it into alternate crests and hollows which line is known as the axis of the waves now notice that in figure eight there are points marked x where the a waves are just as much above the axis as the b waves are below it and vice versa hence at those points the two sets of waves will neutralize each other now turn to the next figure which be it remembered shows the same waves a moment later when they have moved a little farther on in their respective journeys and it will be seen that there too are places marked x where the two sets of waves neutralize each other and the same with the third diagram and finally observe that the places marked x are always the same in all diagrams that is to say they are always the same distance from the line on the right hand side which denotes the reflector it will be clear too that each node is half a wavelength from the next thus it can be shown that at every moment and not merely at the three indicated in the diagrams 
the two sets neutralize each other at the nodes, that the nodes are always in the same places and half a wave length apart. Everywhere else, except at the nodes, there is action more or less energetic, but there is a per perpetual calm. But how can we tell where the nodes are? When we recollect that they are points at which no wave motion at all takes place, it is easy to see that we shall at those points get no spark in our detector. So what Hertz did was to set his oscillator going so that it threw waves upon a reflecting surface and then move his detector to and fro in the neighborhood until he found the nodes. Between the nodes, as will be seen by an inspection of the curves once more, there are other points at which the wave action will be twice as great as with the single wave, and so at those points the response of the detector would be especially energetic. This mutual action between an incident wave and a reflected wave is termed interference, and by it the wavelengths of all the ethereal waves have been measured. The plan used in the case of light waves, although the same in principle, is somewhat different because of the extreme shortness of the waves. So the experiments of Hertz not only showed that long electric waves existed, but that they were in all essentials similar to light, and their wavelengths were ascertained. On that basis has been built up modern wireless telegraphy. It may be interesting to mention at this point a very curious and in a sense pathetic incident. Professor Hughes, whose name is associated with certain well-known instruments for ordinary telegraphy, nine years before Hertz's discovery noticed that a microphone was affected by the action of an induction coil some distance away. He himself attached some importance to the matter, but he allowed himself to be dissuaded from following up the discovery by other scientists, more eminent than himself at the time, who thought that it was not a promising field for investigation. But for the influence of these friends he would possibly be the hero of this story in place of Hertz. Professor Sylvanus Thompson has said that he too noticed the sparks produced at a distance when a Leyden jar was discharged, but he makes no claim to precedence over Hertz, since, seeing the phenomenon, he did not perceive its real meaning, while Hertz, though a little later in time, realized the profound significance of it. Hertz himself, in the account of his experiments, is generous enough to, to assert that, had he not discovered the waves when he did, he is quite certain that Sir Oliver Lodge would have done so. Before proceeding to describe the principal apparatus used in the wireless station, I should like to devote a little space to the explanation of a term which will come up again and again, and which represents that which is responsible to in the main for the marvelous advances which the art of sending wireless messages has achieved in the last few years. I refer to resonance. It will be a great help if the reader will try for himself a simple, inexpensive little experiment. Stretch a string horizontally across a room, and onto it tie two other strings, so they hang down vertically a little distance apart. To the ends of the two strings tie some small objects. A cotton reel on each will answer admirably. They will thus form two pendulums, and to commence with, they should be just the same length. Having rigged all this up, give one pendulum a good swing. It will impart motion of a to and fro variety to the supporting string, which in its turn will pass that motion on to the other pendulum. 
In a very short time, then, the second pendulum will be vibrating like the first. Indeed, the whole motion of the first will shortly become transferred to the second, so that the second will be swinging and the first still. Then the second will retransfer its energy back to the first, and so they will go on until the original energy given to the first pendulum is exhausted. The point to be observed is the quickness with which one pendulum responds to the impulses given it by the other, and the ease with which the energy of the one passes to the other. Now reduce the length of one pendulum. On setting the first in motion, a certain irregular spasmodic action is to be observed in the second but it is very different from the whole-hearted response in the previous instance. In the former case, the second one responded naturally and readily to the first. Now its response is reluctant to in the extreme. It moves somewhat because it is forced to, but it is apparently unwilling. Energy has to be impressed upon it. There is no readiness, because there is no sympathy between them. That sympathy between the two equal pendulums is resonance. The same occurs between two violin or piano strings when they are in tune. The explanation is that a pendulum has a certain natural frequency which depends upon its length. Another pendulum of the same length arranged as just described, therefore imparts impulses to it at just the frequency which is natural to it. Consequently, the effect is a cumulative one, and it responds quickly. Impulses at any other frequency tend more or less to neutralize each other. In the same way, a string of certain length and a certain tension has a frequency peculiarly its own, and it will respond to another similar string because the other gives its impulses at its own natural frequency. It is on record that an engine in a factory happened to run at precisely the same speed as the natural frequency of the building, with the result that after a little time the structure shook so much that it collapsed. Now, electrical circuits in which currents oscillate have a natural frequency of their own. That frequency depends upon the two electrical properties of the circuit, capacity and inductance. And if you want to set up an electrical oscillation in any circuit, you can best do it by giving it impulses at intervals which agree with its natural frequency. Sir Oliver Lodge seems to have been the first to appreciate fully the effects of resonance in wireless telegraphy. It is strange that in England the work of this eminent man in wireless matters is not more fully recognized. When wireless telegraphy reached the point at which the public became interested, Marconi was just coming to the front, and so, forever, will his name be foremost in the public estimation. Indeed, more than foremost, for in the minds of many he monopolizes the credit for this invention. Many people are under the impression that he is the one and only, or at any rate the original, inventor of wireless telegraphy. Now Marconi has done exceedingly valuable work in this field. Moreover, he has been the means of placing the affair on a good commercial footing. By all the same, he is by no means the original or only inventor. While admitting that he is a remarkable man who has done wonders, it is only common justice to refer to the others whose contributions to the solution of the problem are possibly of equal value, and of these few can compare with Sir Oliver Lodge. End of section 12 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.
Section number 13 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin the most striking invention of recent times part two but to return to the question of resonance at first the distances over which messages could be sent were but small now a marconigram can be flung across a hemisphere at first little could be done by day work had to be done mainly at night now communication passes by day and night alike, yet in principle and in many details the instruments are unaltered from what they were several years ago. The main source of all this improvement is the use of resonance. To enumerate broadly the apparatus used for the dispatch and receipt of messages, the following list will be useful. Transmitting End 1 an antenna consisting of a number of wires raised to a considerable height above the ground two a spark gap consisting of a series of metal balls with gaps between them the outer ones being connected to the antenna and to the induction coil three a powerful induction coil with batteries or other source of current to work it four a telegraph key by which the induction coil can be started and stopped at will. Receiving End 1. An antenna precisely similar to the other. 2. A coherer or other oscillation detector. 3. A receiving instrument which may be a writing telegraph instrument, a telephone, any of a number of ordinary telegraph instruments or a galvanometer. Transmitting and sending instruments are, of course, installed at both ends, and either of them can be connected to the antenna at will by the simple movement of a switch. The antenna plays part of one of the metal plates in the Hertz oscillator. Early experiments were made with Hertz apparatus, but the range of such a contrivance is very limited. For one thing, it neglects to take advantage of the earth. It is little realized what an important part the earth plays in the carrying of wireless messages. A very great step was taken when Marconi dispensed with one of the plates of Hertz and used the earth instead, while the other plate gave place to the elevated wires, the most familiar part of the apparatus to most people. The condenser is thus formed by the earth as one plate, the elevated wires as the other, and the intervening air as the insulator. The capacity must be exceedingly small in such an apparatus, but it is sufficient, while the long lines of electrical force stretching from the high antenna to the earth produce waves of great carrying power. Lastly, when the earth forms a part of the condenser, the waves cling to it, so that instead of being largely dissipated into space, they move along the surface of the earth. The advantage of this is obvious. At first it was customary to place the spark gap in the wire leading from the antenna to the earth, as in the accompanying sketch. Later, however, it was found better to place the coil and spark gap in a local circuit in which the oscillations are first produced. These oscillations pass through a coil which is interwound with another one connected to the antenna and to earth, and thus the local oscillations, as we might call them, induce similar oscillations in the antenna just as the fluctuations in one part of an induction coil induce fluctuations in the other. Indeed, the coil in the local circuit and the one in the antenna circuit actually constitute an induction coil. 
the advantage of this is that by introducing condensers the capacity of which can be varied and coils of the inductance of which can be varied into the oscillation circuit it becomes possible to tune the circuits effectively thus resonance comes into play and the power expended can be made to produce the maximum effect some attempts have been made to displace the induction coil in wireless telegraphy altogether by a specially made dynamo these machines can produce either alternating or continuous currents in fact the alternating current dynamo is really simpler than the more familiar continuous current machine the difficulty is however to run it sufficiently fast to produce sufficiently rapid alternations nikola telsa made an alternator to give the alternating current dynamo its short title which could produce fifteen hundred alternations per second while mr w duddle made one which produced one hundred and twenty thousand but neither was satisfactory for the work in question could such a machine be made would it be invaluable for it would be apparent that a continuous succession of waves would be formed by it and not a succession of short trains of waves such as is produced by the induction coil and spark gap the difficulties are not electrical but mechanical it seems doubtful if a machine will ever be made to run with sufficient rapidity which would not knock itself to pieces in a very short time small alternators are used sometimes however to supply alternating current to the primary of an induction coil or transformer as it is more often called in larger sizes the interrupter is only needed when the primary current is continuous from batteries for example alternating current needs no interrupter and so that bother is removed the alternations of a hundred or so per second which are quite the common thing with alternators are just what is needed to excite an induction coil consequently small machines of this kind are to be found in many stations a danish inventor vladimir polson has adopted an altogether different method of producing electrical oscillations which method is the distinctive feature of his mode of telegraphy he takes advantage of a curious effect of passing current between two rods one of which is carbon so as to form an arc such as we see in arc lamps my readers are already familiar with the term shunt in connection with electrical matters and so will perceive at once what is meant when a second circuit is said to be arranged as a shunt to the arc the accompanying diagram will in any case make the matter clear the current comes along from the battery or continuous current dynamo to a hollow rod of copper which to prevent it being melted has cold water continually circulating inside it thence the current jumps across to a carbon rod forming an arc between the two rods and returns whence it came in its journey it traverses the coils of an electromagnet the poles of which are one each side of the arc this tends to blow the arc out as a puff of wind blows out a candle an effect which a magnet always has upon an electric arc the shunt consists of a wire leading from the copper to the carbon rod with a condenser and inductance coil inserted in it the latter coil also forms one part of that coil by which the oscillations in the local circuit are transferred to the antenna the electrical explanation of what happens when the current is turned on to an arrangement like this is rather too complex to set out here it depends upon a curious behavior of the arc it is really a conductor yet it does not behave as ordinary conductors do and the result is 
that the continuous current flowing through the arc is accompanied by an oscillating current in the shunt circuit and the important feature of the arrangement is that these oscillations are continuous in one long train not in a succession of trains the advantage of this has already been referred to one other feature of the apparatus just described should be mentioned since it will seem curious to the general reader for it to work properly it is necessary that the arc should be enclosed in a chamber filled with hydrogen or hydrocarbon gas coal gas is generally used hertz's original discovery was that small sparks could be seen to pass between the ends of a curved wire when the electric waves fell upon it such spark detectors as they are called are useful in the laboratory but not for practical telegraphy several people seem to have noticed in years gone by that a mass of loose metal fillings normally a very bad conductor of electricity became a much better conductor when an electrical discharge of some sort occurred nearby the demand for a wireless receiver had not then arisen however and so the discoveries were not followed up consequently it remained to be rediscovered by branley of paris in 1890 he placed some metal filings in a glass tube the ends of which he closed with metal plugs lying loosely together the fillings would not conduct the current of a small battery from one plug to the other but when a spark occurred not far away they suddenly became conductive and allowed it to pass several years after this sir oliver lodge took up the idea as a receiver for wireless messages and believing that its action was due to the waves causing the filings to cling together he christened it coherer marconi succeeded in making a very delicate form of this although working on strictly the same lines the trouble with coherer is that when once it becomes conductive it remains so unless the filings be shaken apart lodge therefore arranged for the tube to be continually struck by clockwork or by a mechanism like that of an electric bell marconi effected a further improvement by making the current passing through the coherer control the striking mechanism so that the latter is normally quiet but administers one or two taps at just the right moment sir oliver lodge and dr muirhead devised another detector which though quite different in form is really much the same in principle a steel disc with a sharp knife-like edge is made to rotate above a vessel of mercury the edge just touches the mercury but no more on the top of the mercury there floats a thin layer of oil a bad conductor now as the disc revolves it picks up on its edge a film of oil which it carries down into the mercury the film adheres so tightly that it prevents the moving disc from actually touching the liquid metal thus under normal conditions the two are electrically insulated from each other by the film of oil and no current can pass from mercury to disc oscillations however caused by incoming electric waves are able to break through the oil film and so bring disc and mercury into contact whereupon the current flows the constant movement of the disc restores the oil film as soon as the oscillations cease the reason why these detectors act as they do is not quite understood one suggested explanation is that the oscillating currents heat the particles and so partially weld them together another is that adjacent particles become charged as the plates of a minute condenser and so are drawn tightly together as the plates in an electrostatic voltmeter are drawn towards each other 
supposing that the original non-conductivity of the loose fillings be due to the film of air which may surround them either of these things would account for the film being broken or squeezed out resulting in better contact and improved conducting power but both suggestions seem to be contradicted by the fact that if the pieces in contact be of certain substances the coherer works the opposite way under those conditions the conductivity is normally good but the influence of the incoming waves causes it to become bad in eighteen ninety six professor rutherford now of manchester described some discoveries which he had made as to the magnetic effects of oscillations a simple little contrivance which he had constructed was operated by the discharge of a coil half a mile away at that time a great performance this detector was simply an electromagnet with a steel core instead of the usual soft iron core the reason the latter is used in the ordinary magnet is that it loses its magnetism the moment the current ceases to pass through the coil with which it is surrounded while a steel core retains its magnetism for most purposes a steel core would render an electromagnet useless but in this case it was desired that the core should be permanently magnetized so a current was first passed through the coil to magnetize the core and then the coil was connected to a simple form of antenna while swinging magnet was brought near so the magnetic power of the core would be indicated and any change made apparent the effect of the discharge half a mile away was to demagnetize the core slightly this was shown by the movement of the swinging magnet and so the first magnetic detector was found but here perhaps i ought to explain the use of the antenna at the receiving station its function at the sending end has already been made clear the electromagnetic waves coming from the distant transmitter strike the receiving antenna and in doing so set up in it oscillations such as those which set them in motion for every oscillation in the sending antenna there will be another similar in every respect except that it will be feebler in the receiving antenna and the oscillations are here led to the detector of whatever form it may be and in it they make their presence felt in some few cases a duddle thermogalvanometer has been employed as the detector in which the oscillating currents report themselves directly in coheres the detector works by causing the oscillating currents to control a continuous current from a battery and it is the latter which actually gives the signal but there are a number of extremely interesting means which have been invented to detect the oscillating currents by their heating effect r a fessenden for instance has perfected one which is a marvel of delicate workmanship he depends upon the heating of a wire by the currents passing through it such heating is the result of the electrical force acting against resistance and the difficulty is that if the resistance be great it will almost entirely kill the faint oscillating forces in the receiving antenna while if on the other hand it be small the rise in temperature will be inappreciable so he encloses a fine thread of platinum in a glass bulb from which the air is exhausted the platinum wire is first of all embedded in a wire of silver the silver wire is given a core of platinum in fact then the compound wire is drawn down until it is so thin that the platinum core is only 
one and a half thousandths of an inch in diameter. A short length of this compound wire is then bent into an U-shaped loop and its ends connected to thicker wires. Finally, the bottom of the loop is immersed in nitric acid, which eats away the silver at that point and leaves the bare platinum. This is produced a very short length, a few millimeters, of exceedingly thin platinum wire supported at its ends by comparatively thick wires. Being so short, this wire does not offer much resistance and consequently does not materially check the oscillations. At the same time, since it is so fine, it does offer some resistance, and finally, since what heat is generated will be in an exceedingly small space, it will be appreciable there. A telephone is arranged so that the current also passes through the fine wire, and every slight variation in the temperature of the platinum wire by varying in its resistance varies the current through the telephone, and exceedingly slight variations can be detected by sound in the telephone. Thus the oscillations generated in the antenna affect the heat in the wire that affects its resistance, and that again affects the telephone, which finally affects the ear of anyone who is listening to it. It must be understood, however, that this is not a wireless telephone, for the sounds heard are not articulate but merely long and short sounds, representing the dots and dashes of the Morse code. Electrolysis provides us with another form of detector. An exceedingly small platinum wire forms one electrode and a large lead plate the other, and both are immersed in dilute acid. The passage of current from a local battery sets up electrolysis and so stops itself from forming a film of oxygen on the small electrode. This film, however, is broken by the oscillating currents from the antenna, so that as long as they are coming, the battery can, current can flow, but as soon as they cease, the battery current stops itself again. Thus the flowing and stopping of the oscillating currents is exactly copied by the current from the battery which current is led through a telephone or a sensitive galvanometer. It may occur to readers to inquire why the oscillating currents are not passed direct to a galvanometer. The answer is that because they are oscillating, a very sensitive galvanometer is not possible. True, the Duddle thermogalvanometer has been mentioned in this connection. But although it is a beautiful instrument, it cannot compare for delicacy with the direct current galvanometers. The latter are easily a hundred thousand times more sensitive, but the trouble can be overcome by rectifying the oscillating currents, by passing them through a unidirectional conductor, one that is which passes current one way only. These remind one of a turnstile as installed at certain public places, which let you out, but will not let you in unless you pay. In fact, they will not let you in at all. In like matter, rectifiers will only allow those currents to pass which are flowing in one direction, and so they cut out every alternate oscillation thus producing something very like continuous current, which can be detected by the very delicate galvanometers which are usable when continuous currents are concerned, or more often by a telephone receiver. The rectifying conductors are in many cases crystals, hence these detectors are called crystal detectors. Carborundium is a favorite for this purpose. And that brings us to the important question of the secrecy of wireless communication and the measures taken to prevent confusion from the number 
of independent messages flying through the air at the same time. This can be largely achieved by the aid of resonance. Trains of waves flung out by one antenna may strike at several other antennae, but unless the latter are in tune with the sending apparatus, they will probably not be affected appreciably. Let one of them, however, be in tune, and it will pick up easily the message which is not noticed by the others. It is as if three people watching a distant lamp were affected by a form of color blindness which rendered them practically blind to all colors except one. Suppose one could see red only, the other blue and the third yellow. A light sent through a blue glass being robbed of all rays except the blue ones would be visible only to the man who could see blue. The man who could see the blue would, in like manner, be quite blind to light sent through red or yellow glass. Each of them, in fact, could be signaled to quite independently of the others by simply sending him rays of the color to which his eyes were sensitive. In precisely the same way, each wireless receiver is or can be made most sensitive to waves of a particular length and practically blind to others. The operator can adjust his apparatus for certain prearranged wave lengths, and so he can communicate with secrecy to stations whose wave length he knows. The change, of course, is made by altering the capacity or inductance or both. The instruments can be so calibrated that it is quite easy to make the alteration. Then, antennae can be so constructed that messages can be received with most readiness from one particular direction. In others, they can be received from any direction, but the direction can be discovered. This, it will be easy to see, is of great value to ships in a fog. Antennae made with a short vertical part and a long horizontal part radiate best in the direction away from which their horizontal parts point. This is of great advantage in stations which are built specially to communicate with other particular stations. In such cases the antenna is carefully built so as to point in the required direction. Such antennae also receive more readily those signals which come from the direction away from which they are pointing. Reference has been made already to the interesting fact that wireless communication is easier at night than in the daytime. That is probably because of the ionization of the atmosphere by the action of sunlight. Along with visible sunlight, there comes to us from the sun a quantity of light known as ultraviolet, since it makes its effect known in the spectrum of sunlight beyond the violet, which is the limit of visibility at one end of the spectrum. We cannot see it, but it affects photographic plates powerfully. It has energetic chemical powers and it has the ability to make the air more conductive than it is ordinarily. Comparatively little of it penetrates our atmosphere, but it must exercise a good deal of influence, a little higher up. Now readers will remember that the process by which electromagnetic waves are propagated is checked when the wave strikes a conductor. The energy in the waves is then employed in causing currents in the conductor instead of forming more waves, and so partially conductive air forms a partial barrier to the waves. The effect is not appreciable in the case of the tiny waves of light and heat, but it is in the case of the long wireless waves. Everyone has seen the waves of an advancing tide coming up a sandy beach, and has noticed how the dry sand, a good conductor of water, sucks up and destroys the foremost ripples. In like manner, 
are the wireless waves sucked up by the partially conductive atmosphere but the effect of the ultraviolet light does not last long and so at night time it disappears therefore messages can be sent better at night than by day for wireless telephony what is wanted is a continuous uninterrupted train of waves such as those from the Poulsen arc and a receiver of the magnetic type the coherer is no good for this purpose since it either stops the current entirely or lets it flow copiously the magnetic detectors however respond to the variations in the strength of the incoming waves as the latter increase or decrease in strength so does the magnetic detector give out stronger or weaker signals so a telephone transmitter of the ordinary type is made to vary the strength of the oscillations at the sending end while an ordinary telephone receiver is placed in series with the detector at the receiving end thus every slight variation corresponding to sound waves spoken into the transmitter is reproduced in the receiver it is strange that wireless telephony has not made greater progress for it may be said on the word of one of the greatest authorities that wireless telephony is simpler and easier than telephony through a submarine cable in the latter there are almost insuperable obstacles caused by the capacity and inductance of the circuit while the in the wireless method there is very little difficulty there are of course several so-called systems of wireless telegraphy in use there is the marconi in great britain the secret admiralty system in the british navy the de forest in the united states the telefunken in germany not to mention the promising polston system and there are still others but it would be futile to attempt to explain how they differ from one another in a work like this in principle they are alike the precise forms of instrument used may vary but even there there is much in common between them as time goes on there will inevitably be a tendency to more and more uniformity that is always the case for some things are inherently better than others and rival systems although each is working along its own lines always come to very much the same result in the end without making any comparisons it is safe to say that if the telefunken system for example has any points of superiority over the marconi the latter will sooner or later find out the fact and will modify their apparatus accordingly in all probability this will operate both ways and some things which the german system is now using will give place to those which british have in operation in another very modern industry this is very apparent having attended and carefully studied several annual exhibitions of flying machines i have noticed with great interest how the varying types of a few years ago are merging into the more or less uniform types of to-day and it has been the same with wireless telegraphy and will be still more so in the future the best means of generating the waves and the best means of detecting them at a distance that is the whole problem and all the workers in it will sooner or later come to much the same conclusions as to which are the best ways patents may do a little to delay this but not much for one thing patents only last a few years for another a patent only covers a particular way of doing a particular thing a machine that is termed patent is often the subject of a hundred patents each covering a particular little point it is well nigh impossible to patent a whole machine a general principle cannot be patented 
only a particular application of that principle, and so there are in a great many cases little variations of a patented method which are quite as good as the patented one, and which can be used freely. So even patents will not have much effect, in all probability, upon this unification process. But, however, that may be, there is no doubt that the whole world owes a deep debt of gratitude to the men who have worked out this most beneficent of inventions. It is difficult to think of a single one which has ever brought such a load of benefits to poor, struggling humanity as this has. The ship in distress, the lighthouse man on his lonely islet, the explorer in the polar regions, the pioneer settler in the new lands, in fact, just those who most need some connecting link with their fellows, are the people to whom the wireless telegraph brings aid and comfort. All honor to the men who have done it. End of section 13. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 14 of Marvels of Scientific Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marvels of Scientific Invention by Thomas W. Corbin. How Pictures Can Be Sent by Wire The sending of a message by telegraph is easily understandable. Various combinations of two simple signs, such as short sounds and long sounds, can readily be made to indicate letters by which the words can be spelt out. Nor does the sending of sound over a wire make a very good demand upon the credulity. We all know that sound consists of innumerable little waves in the air, and by the simplest of devices these can be converted into variations in an electric current, which variations, by means equally simple, can be made to reconvert themselves back into sound waves at the other end. But to transmit a picture is another matter altogether. It seems barely possible in the case of a drawing, such as a pen and ink sketch, which consists of a comparatively small number of definite lines, but with a shaded sketch or a photograph with its graduations of light and shadow, to transmit such would seem to be beyond the bounds of possibility, did we not know that it had been done. The description of the methods will therefore constitute a not uninteresting subject for a chapter. It is worthy of remark that an attempt along these lines was made many years ago by a man named Castley, and a description of this pioneer apparatus will form a good introduction to the later developments. In figure 13 we see a square which represents a sheet of tinfoil upon which is drawn in non-conductive ink a simple geometrical figure. The ink may be grease or shellac varnish. Indeed, there are many substances which are available to use as an insulating ink. Across the square there are a number of parallel dotted lines, but these, it must be understood, are not actually drawn upon the foil. Their purpose will be apparent in a moment. Suppose that we connect the foil to one pole of a battery and the other pole by a flexible wire to a metal pen or stylus. If we place the point of the pen in contact with the foil, we make a complete circuit through which, of course, current will flow. But if with it we touch one of the non-conductive lines, there will be no current. Taking a ruler, then, let us draw the point of the stylus across the foil in a series of parallel straight lines. 
it is these excursions of the stylus which the dotted lines are intended to represent for nearly the whole of the time current will be flowing but whenever the stylus is crossing one of the lines of non-conductive ink there will be a momentary cessation thus the reader will begin to perceive we obtain what we may call an electrical representation of the figure drawn upon the foil and now let us turn to figure fourteen there too is a square but in this case it is not foil but paper which has been soaked in prusit of potash the reason for introducing this chemical is that it is susceptible to electrical action wherever current passes through it it becomes changed into pursuant blue so that if we place the point of the pen upon the paper and cause current to flow out of that point through the paper there we get a blue dot if while the current is flowing we draw the pen along we get a blue line figure thirteen therefore represents in principle the sending apparatus of Castley's writing telegraph while figure fourteen represents the receiving instrument the two pens are connected together by the main wire in such a manner that when the point of the one is in contact with the bare foil current flows out of the other and into the paper but as the former crosses an ink line all current ceases if then while the sending pen is drawn line by line across the foil the other is drawn at the same speed line by line across the chemically prepared paper we shall get on the latter a series of lines as shown in figure fourteen almost continuous but broken here and there each breakage represents a passage of the sending pen across a line and taken together as will be seen they constitute a reproduction of the geometrical figure drawn upon the foil as shown the lines are rather far apart and so the reproduction is not a very good one they are only drawn so however in order that the principle may be shown the more clearly they may be drawn so that they overlap and then the effect is much better the received picture being almost an exact reproduction of the other it will be noticed that an essential to the success of this method is that the two pens should move in perfect unison and that was the great difficulty Castley used an arrangement of pendulums the best thing available at the time the reproduction is in photographic language a negative a somewhat unsatisfactory feature of the method a simple modification however of the electrical connections will reverse that so that the reproduction shall be a positive there are two ways of cutting off a current from any particular circuit one is to interpose a resistance through which current cannot pass in an appreciable quantity and the other is to provide a second path for the current so much easier than the first that practically all the current will pass that way leaving the first circuit to all intents and purposes free it is as if a farmer wished to stop people passing across a certain field two methods would open to him one to put up a high gate over which no one would dare to climb and the other to provide a shortcut so much more pleasant and convenient than the old path that no one having the choice of the two ways would think of going the old way what the farmer would call a short cut the electrician calls a short circuit and a short circuit is often a more convenient way of cutting off a current than a switch which interposes resistance at all events in a case like this a short circuit enables that to be accomplished which would be very difficult by any other means in the apparatus as already described the battery had to drive the current along a long wire 
terminating at the distant receiving instrument, whence the current returned via the earth. The foil and pen, acting as a kind of electrical tap, controlled this. When foil and pen touched, the tap was open and current flowed. When the line of non-conductive ink interposed itself, the tap was off and the flow ceased. But connect the battery directly to the wire and place the foil and pen in a short branch circuit and the whole thing is reversed. Then the opening of the tap sent current to the other end. Now the opening of the tap causes it to flow round the short branch and leave the main wire. Then the closing of the tap stops the current reaching the farther end. Now it causes it to do so. In fact, the entire action of the apparatus is completely reversed, and the bare parts of the foil become represented by blank paper, while insulating lines produce the marks. In short, a positive results instead of a negative. Such was the scheme of Castley years ago. It is mentioned here at some length, since the principle of it largely reused in an improved form in the most successful of modern apparatus for a like purpose. It undoubtedly was a very excellent scheme, simple and effective, which ought to have succeeded, but it did not do so for the sufficient reason that at the time knowledge of electricity and skill in constructing delicate mechanism were not so highly developed as they are today. For success, as has already been said, one thing was essential, and that thing very difficult to obtain, a perfect synchronism between one stylus and the other, if the one were but the slightest degree out of step with the other, failure followed inevitably. So the electrical transmission of sketches dropped for the time being. More recently a perfect successful solution of the problem has come in another way altogether. This apparatus, at first called the teleautograph, but now known as the telewriter, it will be more convenient to refer to later. Of modern systems for the transmission of pictures, the most successful probably are the Korn teleautograph and the Thorn Baker telectograph. Both of these are able to transmit very fair reproductions of photographs besides line drawings. The difficulty with photographs is, of course, that many parts of them are not of equal blackness or whiteness, but shade off gradually from one into the other. Take the case of a simple portrait. Part of the subject's face will be pure white, while the side in shadow will be comparatively dark. There is not hard and fast line between the two, but a graduation through an infinite number of shades, the one tones into the other. How can it be possible to convey that, more or less mechanically, over a wire? The solution is due to the fact that the eye will blend together a number of distinctly different shades, if properly arranged, into a gradual change. Really, the change is step by step, but the effect is apparent quite continuous. This can be seen in the half-tone illustrations in this book. Close examination will show that a picture is cut up into small squares. In the pure white part of the squares are invisible, while in the perfectly black parts, if there be any, they are so merged into one another as to be inseparable but everywhere else in the picture it will be seen there are squares each with a dot in the middle. In the darker parts the dots are large, in the lighter ones they are small. We get the effect almost of color, although the picture is done entirely in black ink. The eye does not see the individual dots when we are just looking at the picture. We have to examine it very closely to find them yet they are there all the time, and it is simply the peculiar action of the eye which sees beautiful half-tones, shading imperceptibly one 
into another, whereas in real fact there are only a vast number of equidistant dots, all equally black. We see, therefore, that it is possible to split up a picture of any kind into a number of small squares, and to treat each square as being of equal darkness throughout. Then, if we can communicate by wire that particular degree of darkness to a distant station where the small parts can be put together in their proper order and given their correct shade, the picture as constructed at the receiving end will be something like that at the sending end. And we have only to make the size of each separate square small enough to obtain copy which will resemble the original very closely indeed. In the early days it was actually proposed to telegraph pictures by ordinary telegraphy, using this principle. The suggestion was agreed upon a code of twenty-six shades, called by a letter of the alphabet. One shade was to be A, the next B, and so on. Then the picture was to be divided up into squares, and that particular shade of each square telegraphed by means of the corresponding letter. The shades thus communicated were to be put together at the receiving end on a prearranged system, and so the picture was to be built up. Given plenty of time, that scheme might be moderately successful, but to get a really good reproduction the subdivision needs to be so minute, and the number of squares therefore so immense that it would be quicker to send the picture by train than to telegraph it by such laborious means. In a fairly coarse half-tone block the squares are, say, 2,500 to the square inch. That number of letters would therefore have to be telegraphed for every square inch of picture transmitted, to say nothing of the difficulty of building up a picture of such great number of parts and giving to each the desired shade. That idea, abortive though it is in its crude form, illustrates very clearly the fundamental principle on which this work is done. The problem is really to devise a machine which will do the same thing rapidly and automatically divide up the original into a large number of squares, and then send an electric current to represent each square, such current by its strength to indicate the shade of the square, and finally a similar instrument is needed to act as receiver, and to reproduce those squares in the proper order, giving to each its correct shade. In practicality all of them the mechanism is rotary original being placed upon a drum which turns round under a stylus, or its equivalent, while the stylus gradually travels along from end to end after the manner of the needle of a phonograph, or else the same result being achieved by the drum itself having an endwise movement as well as a rotative one. The receiving instrument is of similar form, and both must start together move at the same speed and indeed preserve a perfect correspondence with each other. If the distance be great between the two, there might be difficulties due to the retardation of the currents passing between them. Electricity does not pass through long wires, particularly if they be under the sea, with anything like the quickness which we are adapted to think. Over a short line and under favorable circumstances, the receipt of a telegraph signal at the farther end is practically instantaneous. But on long lines and under certain conditions, that is far from being the case. Then something has to be done to quicken the action of the current, or else the receiving drum must be made to lag behind the sending drum by the requisite amount. In some cases, too, the transmitting apparatus loses a little time in sending off the currents, and that, too, has to be allowed for, so that, all things considered, the reader will see that the successful solution of the problem is hedged about 
with many subtle difficulties which are probably only appreciated by those who are well acquainted by sad experience with the little vagarities of both electricity and mechanical devices neither of them does quite what we want it to do each suffers from little faults which in the case of a delicate problem like this where a difference of a hundredth of a second would be fatal to success introduce difficulties almost insuperable to transmit line drawings professor korn uses a sending instrument very like that of Castley. the picture is placed either by hand or photographically upon a sheet of copper foil which is fixed round the rotating cylinder the lines being formed of non-conducting material the foil being electrified and the stylus connected to the line or main wire currents pass to the farther end just as in the old apparatus at the receiving end the drum is covered with photographic paper and enclosed in a light tight box through a hole in this box a fine pencil of light passes from a lamp suitable lenses being used to ensure that the pencil shall have as it were a very fine point producing a very small spot of light upon the paper if the light remains quite steady the drum meanwhile rotating a line will be drawn by it upon the paper which will be visible when the latter is developed since the drum not only turns upon its axis but also moves endwise one hundredth of an inch at every revolution this line will be a spiral the turns of which will be one hundredth of an inch apart thus the paper will be blacked practically uniformly all over should the intensity of the light vary however the line at times will be lighter than at others well should it be cut off altogether for a moment then there will be a corresponding gap in the line and it is easy to see that if these lighter parts or gaps occur in the correct places they will form a picture in other words by controlling that light we can build up a picture upon the paper the question is how to control it professor korn uses a form of the Eithenthoven galvometer already described instead of the silvered fiber generally employed in this instrument a silver wire is fitted the movement of which partly or entirely cuts off the pencil of light the corn transmitter for photographs is quite different although the receiver is practically the same as what has just been described the basis of it is a peculiar power possessed by the metal selenium when in a certain state this like all metals is a conductor of electricity but of course offers resistance in some degree now the special feature of selenium is that its resistance is reduced if light shine upon it suppose then that current be flowing through a mass of selenium and that the latter be suddenly illuminated brightly the resistance will at once fall and the current increase on the other hand should the light falling upon the selenium diminish its resistance will increase and the current flowing through it will decrease in short given a suitable arrangement the current flowing in a circuit of which a selenium cell forms a part will increase or decrease with the increase or decrease in the light falling upon the cell a while ago the papers were telling striking stories of a way by which blind people so it was said were to be recompensed for the loss of their sight a new sense as it were was to be given them by which they could hear light even if they could not see it all this had reference to this curious property of selenium as being of course an undoubted fact that it will vary an electric current in accordance with the variations in the light and if that current be led through a telephone receiver a man by holding that to his ear 
could, in a sense, hear the variations in the light. In the corn transmitter for photographs, selenium is employed as follows. A transparent photograph is made on a celluloid or gelatine film, and this is fixed upon a glass cylinder mounted as already described. A pencil of light falls upon this in much the same way as in the case of the receiver just described, and as the cylinder resolves, describes a fine spiral line all round and round it. Moreover, the light passes right through the photograph and falls upon a mirror inside, of which it is reflected on to a selenium cell. At every moment, then, the light is falling upon some small part of the photograph, and the amount of it which gets through and ultimately reaches the selenium depends upon the density of that part. Current, meanwhile, is flowing from a battery through the selenium, and thence over the main wire to the distant station. As the light pencil traces its spiral path over the rolled-up photograph, every variation in the density of the picture is reproduced as a variation in the current through the selenium. This, at the remote end, operates the Eisenhoven galvometer, the movements of which vary the shade of the spiral line being drawn upon the photographic paper. This process takes place with remarkable celerity, so that in a few minutes the innumerable variations constituting a complete photograph can be transmitted and faithfully recorded at the distant end of the wire. But perhaps the most successful of these methods is that known as the telelectrograph. It is surprisingly like the scheme of a Castley in principle, and forms another example of the fact that good ideas often fail through lack of a proper means to carry them out. Mr. Thorne Baker, the inventor of the telectrograph, has had at his disposal accumulated stores of knowledge and skill which did not exist in Castley's time. Consequently, the former has made a brilliant success where his predecessor produced only an interesting but somewhat ineffective attempt. Reference has been made already to the half-ton blocks wherein a host of small dots of varying sizes make up a picture. Now, instead of parallel rows of dots, parallel lines of varying thicknesses will give very much the same result. The former are made by photographing the picture through a sheet of glass ruled with two sets of lines at right angles to each other. The latter can be made by using a screen with lines one way only instead of two ways. It is therefore quite easy for a block maker to produce a process block wherein lines are used instead of dots. For this particular purpose, however, it is not an ordinary block that is needed, although it is in essentials very similar. The picture to be transmitted is photographed through a screen as if a half-tone block were to be made. The negative so obtained is then printed by the gum process onto a sheet of soft lead, and after washing the picture remains upon the lead in the form of lines of insoluble gum on a background of bare lead. A squeeze in a press drives the gum into the lead and so gives the whole sheet a smooth surface over which a stylus will ride easily, but which is, nevertheless, made up of conductive parts and non-conductive parts, the latter forming the picture. The lead sheet is then put upon a revolving cylinder and turned under a moving stylus in the manner with which we are now familiar. The sheet is placed with the lines lengthwise of the cylinder so that the current passes to the stylus, except as it passes over the breadth of the lines, and so similar lines are built up at the distant ends. The receiving mechanism is of the electrochemical type which Castley used. 
the current passes from the receiving stylus to the paper and there makes its mark in a way that will be understood from the description of the earlier apparatus the supreme advantage of this method of working over that of professor corn is that the operator can see what he is doing to obtain good results a number of electrical adjustments have to be made and whether he has got them right or wrong can be seen as soon as the picture begins to grow upon the receiving paper if a little readjustment be needed the operator sees it and can set things right before the really important part of the picture begins to appear whereas the corn apparatus he does not know what is happening at all since he can see nothing until the picture is finished and the photographic paper has been developed it will be apparent too to anyone who has carefully considered the wireless telegraphy chapters that it ought to be possible to make the sending stylus or its equivalent control a wireless transmitter and a wireless receiver to operate the receiving stylus so as to be able to send pictures by wireless experiments to this end have been made with some measures of success and sooner or later we are almost sure to hear the difficulties which are by no means small have been overcome but we cannot conclude this chapter without a fuller reference to that marvelous invention the telewriter in this a man makes a sketch with a pen on a piece of paper or maybe he writes a message and simultaneously a pen hundreds of miles away if need be does precisely the same thing the receiving instrument draws the sketch line by line or it transcribes the message in an actual handwriting of the sender a little touch almost weird in its naturalness is that every now and then the receiving pen leaves the paper and dips itself into a bottle of ink after which it resumes its work at the very spot where it left off now how the complicated lines and curves the strokes and dots which make up a written language even the little shakes and deficits which give each man's writing a personality of its own how all these can be sent over a wire is at first sight very difficult to understand the inventor of this apparatus has discovered an extremely simple way of doing it but even he does not attempt to do it with one wire it should be said for he uses two this is no drawback when as is often the case it is used in conjunction with the telephone for the latter to be effective also requires two wires years ago single wires were employed for telephones as for telegraphs the circuit being completed through the earth but the difficulty arose that every wire through which currents flow is apt to induce currents in neighboring wires the induction coil is based upon that fact and so messages in one wire were overheard on others or what was perhaps more annoying still the dots and dashes passing in a telegraph wire would produce loud noises in a telephone wire that happened to be near the use of two wires however entirely removes that trouble for the neighboring current then induces two currents instead of one one in each and it so happens that these are opposed to each other so that they neutralize each other so every telephone wire now is double and therefore is ready as it were to have the telewriter fitted to it but even with two wires the difficulty seems insuperable until we remember that most complex of curves can be resolved in two simple movements the sending pen with the original writing or drawing is done is attached to the junction of two light rods the farther end of each rod is attached to the end of a light crank fixed so that it can rotate or oscillate after the manner of cranks in the plane of the desk upon which the paper lies 
all the joints mentioned are of the hinged nature so that as the pen is moved about the rods turn more or less one way or the other the two cranks this simple mechanism it will be observed carries out very effectively the principle just mentioned for it resolves the motion of the pen no matter how complicated it may be into a simple rotating motion of the two cranks so the cranks turn this way or that as the draughtsman makes his picture and it is very easy to arrange that their movement shall vary the strength of two electric currents whereby we obtain electric currents varying in accordance with the movement of the cranks this is done by making each crank operate a variable resistance or rheostat when in its extreme position on one side the crank permits current to flow freely but as it moves over to the other extreme position the resistance in the path of the current is increased such an arrangement is a common feature in its electrical apparatus so current from a battery flows to the two wires leading to the distant station each passing through the rheostat connected to one of the cranks we may think of the rheostats as taps which can be turned on or off by the actions of the cranks let us imagine that crank a is in the position when the current flows freely when the electrical tap is fully open then a strong current will flow along wire a returning to the sending battery via the earth as that crank is moved the current will gradually be reduced until if moved right over to the other extreme the current will be at its feeblest arriving at the other end this current passes to a device which we may describe simply as a magnet so arranged that its action pulls round a crank against the restraining action of a spring now the stronger the current the more does the magnet pull and the farther does the receiving crank turn the sending crank varies the resistance the resistant varies the current the current varies the strength of the receiving magnet and the magnet varies the position of the receiving crank properly adjusted then the motion of the crank at the one end is communicated through that long chain of causes and effects until at last it is repeated exactly by the movement of the crank at the other end this same thing occurs simultaneously over each of the two wires crank a at the sending end communicating over wire a to crank a at the other end while crank b communicates its motion over wire b to the other crank b each sending crank is closely imitated in its every action by the corresponding one at the distant station the two receiving cranks are connected by light rods to the receiving pen in precisely the same way that the sending pen is connected consequently not only are the separate movements of the two cranks repeated at the remote station but the complex movements of the sending pen which gave rise to the action of the cranks are also conveyed to and repeated by the recording pen the movements of the first pen are resolved into rotating motions by the two cranks these are transferred to the other cranks and their movements are in turn converted back into the written curves thus as the pen in the artist's hand draws his sketch so does the automatic hand at the other place it may be at a great distance repeat faithfully his work and the sketch grows line by line simultaneously at both ends there is no space here to detail how by another current superposed upon those referred to already the receiving pen is made to dip itself periodically into the inkwell at the will of the sender by a cunning use of alternating current this is done 
without any way interfering with the action of the cranks as described above but of course there is severe limitation to the usefulness of this machine inasmuch as the drawing has been made at the time of transmission and it can only be put on a wire by the hand of the artist himself end of section 14 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc